So for people who, who might not know, the Contemporary Talk series is, is a now four-year-old initiative where we bring in keynote speakers from the worlds of curating, architecture, design, uh, gallery dealers, artists, certainly <coughs> architects, to talk about what they do and why they do it, and the range of folks who have been here before in this series is a quite august group of folks, and our uh, duo today is certainly in that same uh, canon of awesomeness. So um, I want to give you a little bit about their bios. I usually always underdo the bio thing, but part of it's really challenging when you have people who've been doing amazing work in the field for 30, 40 plus years in some cases, and 20 some odd years. So let me just tell you a little bit about Hetty Jones and Kelly Jones, and then we'll have a conversation. You're in luck, and we're in luck in that this is the, only the second time that Kelly and Hetty have done a conversation like this. The one at the Studio Museum in Harlem around the time that Kelly's book, I Minded, came out. So we're really happy to have them in Atlanta. I'll just tell you a little bit about um, I'm going to start with Hetty, since Hetty is someone I met 20 plus years ago uh, through artists in New York City. And she has written 23 books for children and adults, including her, I would say, infamous memoir, The Beat Scene, and her own emergence as a writer and thinker and mother and activist called How I Became Hetty Jones. Uh, which is an amazing book, and we have some uh, available up at the front desk if you're interested in, in that. Um, she's written a series of poetry books, one called Drive, one called Turning Seven, uh, doing, doing, doing seven <coughs> um, which has multiple implications. Um, <laughs> she's been honored by the New York Public Library. She's been the, not only her own memoir, which is so awesome, but she authored with Bob Marley's widow Rita, Rita's memoir. Um, she has been the former chair of the Penn Prison Writing Committee. She's taught in prison, she's taught children, she's been the editor of Aliens at the Border, poetry collection from her workshop at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. She's lectured wildly, wildly and widely. Um, she's worked at the 92nd Street Y Poetry Center in the graduate program. Uh, writing program at the school. Um, Kelly Jones is an unbelievable curator and writer who is currently the associate professor in art history and archaeology at Columbia at the Institute for Research there. Um, her research runs a wide range from African American and African diaspora studies, uh, Latin American artists, issues in contemporary art, museum theory. She was, many of you may know, in 2005, the first recipient of the Driscoll Prize given by the High Museum. So she's been in and out of Atlanta for many years and for various reasons. Um, she was scholar in residence at the Rockefeller Foundation Study and Conference Center in Bellagio, Italy, an amazing place. Her writings have appeared in magazines and journals, including Art Forum, Flash Art, Atlantica, Third Text, amongst others. And the book, which we'll discuss a little bit today, I Minded Living and Writing Contemporary Art from Duke University Press, was named one of the top art books in 2011 by Publishers Weekly. Um, and her curatorial work, she's organized exhibitions at the Johannesburg Biennial, the San Paolo Biennale, um, and for many of you, uh, the most immediate thing, now dig this, Art and, art and Black Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980 which is a show that I was telling her yesterday I've had a chance to see in three different venues, which I think is the first time that's ever happened. I, I saw it going with a toaster or something. I saw it at the Hammer. I saw it in, in New York. Stacy, yeah, we saw it at the Williams College last summer. Um, so it's wonderful to have you both here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this kind of talk could go in a variety of ways, but what I really want them to do Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
the new lecture series. This is the new spirit of adventure. As long as the leg is not broken. How do we come back from that is the challenge. We're now going to be back. Later on, I was going to ask you about the difficulty of leaving an artistic life and some of the risks involved, but maybe we'll just start with that. Um, so I wanted to ask you, both of you, about the nature of, in a sense, being public intellectuals, being people who have, because of your teaching, because of your writing, because of your work in the arts and in literature, you have many years of dealing with trying to tell stories, trying to speak for constituents. Can you talk a little bit about some of the pleasures and some of the risks involved? <laughs> Well, um, I, you know, I think I'd like to start with thinking about my memoir because I, I have resisted writing it for such a very long time, although publishers kept saying, oh, you have to talk about it. This is what I thought, oh, and, and we're going back. The book was published in 1990, but for maybe 20 years before that, people have asked me for that particular story. And my, kept thinking was, oh, they just want to get between the sheets. What is it, you know, what is it like interracial sex? And, and I thought, oh, let me just run far away. Uh, I see you know, open mouths, people not believing that in this day and age, but that was the way I felt it. And so I have always, I've, I've gotten more, I suppose, uh, to people asking personal questions, um, but I, I try really to focus on what it is like to be an artist living in a number of worlds where you are trying to put it all together and, and be inclusive of everything and, and in many ways standing at the center where everyone feels comfortable. Um, so that's how I've come to look at it, um, just thinking about it in those terms. Um, risk, I guess, well, I, I want to start by thinking about my mom because uh, one of the awards that she did win was the Norma Farber First Book Award uh, for First Book of Poetry, and, you know, she was in her 60s when she won that award. And um, that says, the risk that you take you keep believing all this time that you're an artist, no matter what anybody says about you, because of your gender, because you're a mother, because whatever, right? Because you're not 20 when you win that award, but you're in your 60s. So that was um, something that you know, made me think that the greatest artists that I've worked with, and particularly after doing Now Take This, where I'm working with people many of them in their 70s, that one of the things is that they just kept doing it. And they really don't care what people say. Or they care for a minute, and then they get over it, and then they just do the work. <laughs> and, um, and I think that example uh, from my mom and from artists that I've worked with over the years uh, helps me to keep focus. Because if they can keep focus, um, then I can. And it's really just about doing the work that you feel you have to do. And you know, I get asked this by students and younger people, like, how did you do it? I just kept doing the work that I knew that I had to do. And is there risk with that? Yes, because people say, well, why are you focusing on African Americans so much? And why are you doing this? Well, everybody's always your critic. But you just keep doing what you feel uh, you have to do. And sure, you know, take advice and criticism and listen. It's not like you're not listening to other voices, but you really have your focus and you just keep <coughs> on that and uh, it's worth it. Oh, yeah. Check, check your 
pad it off and, and turn it. It's on. It's on again. Green light. It's on green light. Keeps this one doesn't like me as soon as I keep speaking. It clicks off, but it's green. Yeah, you can hear me because I talk like I'm in New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now it sounded like it went on well, but that was being bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, in the intro to your book, you mentioned the obligation of the archive, the idea that that there is a set of knowledge that one's trying to make sure has a presence. Uh, that many of the things that you've written, the interviews that you've done, um, you've both been involved with various ideas about this notion of preserving certain kinds of histories or speaking to and for certain constituents. Could you try to unpack that a little bit? That is, what does the notion of the archive mean to both of you? Um, well, <laughs> I had an archive because I couldn't bear some of the things that I got in the mail that announced shows and um, were just too pretty, <laughs> and and um, I felt that they were important. So of course I was just too busy to keep a, a careful record of things, but I just put them away in a box. And then um, a few years ago, I was able to hire a student. I said, "You do, just yeah. sort it all out." But saving things that I knew had some significance, like uh, the first poster that from the first happenings um, in New York, um, and um, uh, just uh, flyers from poetry readings when poetry readings began to be the way that one understood poetry and, and gathered large audiences. Even if it was just a piece of paper, it was there as a record, and I knew somehow instinctively that you weren't supposed to throw that away because maybe everyone else had thrown it away when it came through the mail slot. And so I have had a record and, and then um, when Columbia was interested, it's now in Columbia and anybody can go and look at everything that happened, well, 50 years ago and stuff. And like, Ooh, look at that. So. That's probably where I got it from. I, I keep a lot of stuff too, but I think just you know, growing up with parents that are in the public eye, and you're always aware that there's a public eye, and then there's another part of life that is not a public eye. And um, but the public eye is, at least in this case, you know, maybe if I was Miley Cyrus, I would feel different. But you know that it's important. That it's important. That it exists because um, people need to know that information. And so you want to um, you know, preserve that. And I guess my impulse as a historian, I mean, it, um, when I give talks about the book, another question I get is people say, well, you kind of narrate that you grew up in this life of artists. And so that's how you became interested. What about those of us who didn't grow up? in this life, does that mean we're cut out? And I was like, no, because as you can see, I still went on to get a PhD in art history, uh, because I just love art history, and it can be art history. I mean, I have a specific focus, but I really enjoy art from all over the world, you know? And so I think that's part of my personality, that the historian in me is just drawn to chronicling history, and you know, particularly the history I have chosen to chronicle, which are the ones that are kind of more underknown, you know. But and part of it came from you know going to school in New York, going to an art school, and being there in a you know New York public high school. And uh, one of my college friends also grew up in New York is here right now. And um, so knowing what that's about, it's a very diverse environment. And then you're reading books in which nobody who's diverse affairs. I mean, this has been years ago by now. And you just figure, like, how does that happen? You know, why is that the case? Because I actually know Latin American artists. They're in the class with me. And you're going to tell me I'm in school with 2,500 people and nobody's going to make it? So that just didn't work. And then I went to college and it got even worse because then you're really studying this stuff and people, all the artists who are artists of color, are dead, like many years, they're Mayans, 
you know, they're Egyptians. It's like well, it's thousands of years ago. You mean there's no the person of African descent was an artist, but I just was at Jack Whitten's house babysitting for him. <laughs> it, you know, it just didn't make sense. So I actually knew living artists before I understood that you're not supposed to know about those people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that everybody's supposed to be dead. Uh, that's who you're supposed to study. So it was part of my own experience that I learned that, but thank goodness, you know, there's other ways to come into that now, and that now students don't have to have that kind of disconnect. Now we have to pause for oh, like yeah. okay. just, just, just I, I'm going to add to that a little bit while this is going on. Uh, that I, I always tell people, look, people say, well, you must have had such a wonderful background and, and uh, literary, and what did you read when you were a child? <laughs> I came from a house where there were no books. And that's why, and when I speak in libraries, I try to bring that up because I came from a totally, not just not intellectual, but anti-intellectual. People who were suspicious of people who knew more and read more. And so um, my, I, maybe it was my perversity that I wanted to do it. But I, I felt that there had to be more to life, and, um, and I found my way on my own, and I encourage, when I, I do a lot of community and prison work, and I encourage people, it doesn't have to be a certain class of people who has access. You can do it too, if that's what you desire. So, uh, you know, I think it, it works in many ways, and Kelly was, fortunate that there was a whole world into which I, I, I brought her, but uh, she would have gotten there by herself anyway. She's my kid. <laughs> so I want to ask you, I was, um, I was reading the New York Times yesterday, and Anthony Caro, the British sculptor, passed away. I thought it was interesting in his obituary, he, the obituary ends with a comment from him about the nature of work, and he said, I think it's my job to push sculpture forward, to keep it moving and keep it alive. And you don't keep it alive just by doing what you can do, you keep it alive by trying to do things which are difficult. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in the notion of your work lives as working against things. Um, and I just, there's something heavy in, in, uh, in your memoir, and it's relating to the def, one of the definitions on the, the beat generation, the phrase here is, uh, Jack Kerouac had thought up the beat generation in conversation with another writer, John Clellan Holmes, who later explained beat as pushing up against the wall of oneself. And so I'm interested in this idea about what one pushes against, either things in yourself, things in the culture, how do you keep this work moving forward? Well, I, I always tell people, and so far as writing is concerned, and I'm sure that this is exactly what Carol was trying to get to also. Um, it, they used to tell you, oh, write what you know. But what I knew was not, what I knew was that I didn't know enough. And so I, I really changed my approach to write what you do not know in an effort to understand it. So sometimes uh, my students will say, well, I don't know how to say this. Well, try, and then edit, because writing is editing in large part, and you go from what you don't understand, and you know, someone asked me, oh, Kelly was going to ask me, how come you never dated your poems, right? Dates on any poems for a historian, you're like, this is killing me. <laughs> but but I would start things and then it just wasn't working, or I just didn't feel it adequately said what I wanted to say. And so I just put it aside and then take it out and look at it again. And sometimes that took months or years, and oh yeah, now I can 
And even things that have been published, I've changed. I just noticed in one of my books, things are, you know, there's a little bit of handwriting in there. It's like, ooh, gee, when did I do that? But um, it's, it, you, you go from what you don't know, and, and you go, it, when it comes from in here to out there, and there's something on a piece of paper, that's where you begin. And then you begin to understand it through the process of working on it. And so I didn't know how to date my stuff because I might have started it in January and finished it in December. And then if you write January through December, it looks like an awful, like what, what did you do in all of that time when there are only six lines? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but why not just date it like at the end when you finish it? Who cares if it's 10 years later? Nobody knows, but see, you tell the people that nobody knows. 1978. So you started in 1968. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, unless you, you can tell people that, but I, yeah. but I, I know. I know. But why not just do that when it's finished? Because you never think it's finished. Is that really? Yeah, funny? yeah. Okay. When yeah, if you date it, then you put a period at the end of the sentence. And um, even now, I have stories that I did write back in the day. And, <laughs> And, and then I think, well, that word doesn't, that's not right. Oh, I have to fix that now because I know better. So which date do you put on it? I know, that's very bad. I'll try it harder. No, but it's not, you know, other people, other people do this. Like Susan Rothenberg was famous for doing that, like installing a show of her paintings. And then it, during the install, she's like still painting. Or like as it's installed in this picture, well, you know, that gray doesn't really look right. There's lights on her hat. Another, you know, she's famous for doing that. And other artists, I'm sure, are, are famous um, visual artists for, for changing things uh, in, in the install. So it's not surprising, but. I like so when are <laughs> so, so let me ask you, apropos of that, when are exhibitions finished? Well, um, you know, they're finished in each space. You know, and, and that's the thing that I've come to know about exhibitions. I mean, as you know, there are these massive um, you know, kind of configuration of objects. Um, here you have over 200, and my now do this, I have over 100, and thinking about it, how it's laid out, sight lines, making sure everything's safe, blah, blah, blah. But they're ephemeral. They're totally ephemeral. And um, so when it's gone, it's gone. And when it's in the next space, it looks totally different usually from the last space it was in, because each space is different. And um, for me, as long as the narrative, because I have tended to work narratively in, as a curator, as long as the narrative continues in some way that makes sense, it doesn't really matter. And for, I've been a curator for over 30 years. Most of that time, over 20 years, I've never been, I've not been in an institution. Right. I've always worked as a guest curator. You know, people keep you know, calling me and offering me a contract to do X, Y, Z. And so because of that, I also work very collaboratively, although my ideas I'm very fixated on, but you want to install it this way because light comes in this way, because you know, the fire exit is over here, and you're the chief curator. It's fine. I don't have a problem with that, as long as my narrative can still be in place, because for me, shows are about ideas that manifest themselves visually. But they're they're totally they're totally ephemeral. And once now dig this closes December third on its last leg at Williams College, that's it. You know? Um, and you have the catalog, but it's it's not the same as walking through. So let me ask you about feedback in terms of both of you and, and why I'm here is now dig this generated a certain amount of thoughtful feedback. And then it generated a certain amount of controversial feedback, yeah. specifically the uh, New York Times review by Ken Johnson, which sort of raised a question about who gets to speak and who gets to answer and who's in and who's out. What can you say about an exhibition? And I'm interested, not necessarily to chew on all of that, but the idea of what kind of feedback you get as a writer, as your sense of who's reading you as a curator in terms of who's seeing what you do, who's telling you anything 
in response to what you do, and how is that incorporated into your process, or how much or how little actual dialogue in the after production do you have? Um, well, I think, you know, you know, in forms like this or in forms of the show, there's always a dialogue and people always have questions. Um, I think in that particular case of Ken Johnson, he, you know, well, he had a, in my, in my view, he had a kind of skewed idea of what history is. Art history, his art history was long. And then also he, he had a, he kind of had a vendetta because everybody loved the show so much. He was like, I didn't want to really critique the show. This is what I heard from people. I didn't get into it. But, um, you know, but he has a right to his opinion. I think it's wrong. I think it's based on, you know, I have never, I mean, I think, to me, art is about democracy, you know, um, anybody can come and see a piece, they have a different read on it based on who they are than somebody else does, and, and that's perfectly okay, um, but, you know, I have a right to my narrative as a curator, and I've worked on this idea for many years, and, but it's not the only idea, you know, so, um, but if your art history is wrong, your art history is wrong, what can you say? In my mind, you know, uh, you can't say that Kurt Schwitters and, and you can say Kurt Schwitters and Picasso and Brock made a collage and, and, and assemblage popular, but they did not invent it because people in all cultures around the world, as we can see here, yeah, we're putting things together, right? we're putting things together yeah. different disparate things. And so the history of assemblage, if you really look at it, and, and this is where they were getting it from too. I mean, Picasso doesn't really talk about that until the 70s. He doesn't really admit that he's looking at African art uh, until much later in his life, but they're all looking at these other cultures. To, so to say these people invented it is, is patently wrong. You can say they popularized it in the West, which is correct. Um, but we don't teach that in art history anymore. We don't teach that they invented it anymore. Uh, not in, at Columbia, at least. We don't, nobody teaches that. So, so yeah. See what happens when people, which is when, when, when discussions about history and who owns what, <laughs> the sound goes nuts. That's what happens. <laughs> Hedy, what kind of feedback have you got? Um, over the years well, a lot of the. Um, not, not to poetry, generally, except um, why don't you rhyme? Why don't you take your poems? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, to my memoir and, uh, and other things, oh, and uh, earlier in my career, I began writing children's books. And I find this a very interesting place to start, the feedback that I got. And of course, I wanted my whole purpose in writing children's books. And the first one uh, that I sold in 1969, before you move, um, <laughs> it was about Rosa Parks and the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. And the Dial Press bought it, but then they never published it. Mm. And I was mystified, but I realized, of course, it was much too soon. It would have been thought of as a political statement, and you don't give children any idea about politics unless they learn. Uh, however, um, then the second book came out in 1971, and it was a collection of uh, uh, American Indian poetry for children. And that was very popular because it rescued things from talk about archives, but rescued things from the Bureau of American Ethnology in the latter part of the 19th century, of records that began to be kept. And so I just went on from there, but uh, when I finally got to writing uh, a story, a contemporary story, about uh, a young, in, uh, a teenage interracial girl, not any of my children, um, uh, who has an encounter on the New Jersey shore that makes her question who she is, etc. And she she calls herself a Polominican because her mother's Polish and her father's Dominican. And um, it was trashed 
by an organization called the Council on Integration Books for Children, who said that one must never consider that being interracial has its problems. And we're talking in the mid 19, uh, early 1980s. And then the book was shredded by the publisher because it was too controversial. Nowadays, you wouldn't think twice about publishing a book like that. So that feedback was totally detrimental to my career, and I, I said, no more. And that's when I decided to write my memoir, uh, because I said, the people have to learn the truth about these kinds of things. But the feedback that I've gotten from the memoir is, why didn't you tell about that party? You know, I was there, and you didn't write about that. <laughs> Why didn't you talk about too much, you know, more drug use, etc.? Oh, I didn't want to. That wasn't my particular subject. But you know, there was always more to it, and you should write more. And when will you come out with the second volume of your memoirs? all about how you made it alone. Da, da, da. <laughs> so, uh, that's the kind of feedback that I <laughs> So you can either take it or ignore it. Uh, but, you know, people nowadays are so much more good-hearted and more accepting about the history of things, I think. I want to ask you about, um, well, actually both of you. So, um, Kelly's book, I Minded, is, is notable for a bunch of reasons, but one of the most interesting things I think about it is that family members, including Hetty and her sister Lisa and her father, Amira Baraka, have, and her husband as well, have comments that sort of have texts and, in a sense, introductions to certain chapters. But something poked out at me that I wanted to ask both of you about. Um, this is from Lisa. Kelly listened to Earth, Wind, and Fire albums more than anyone is humanly capable of at high volume for a period of at least half a decade. And so what I, I want to ask you about the influence of music, because you have a history, Hetty, as well, of having been in the milieu with numerous jazz musicians and, and, and um, uh, in the Lower East Side and the New York scene, and so the presence of music in both of your lives or in your work and its influence. Okay. Um, well, we were talking about my sister, but she, you know, she starts, I mean, she's an amazing writer, uh, but she also starts out as a writer, as a journalist. So, you know, it's on when she gets to whatever, because she will talk about you and find all the little details as journalists. Anybody who's ever spoken to a journalist, or if you are a journalist, um, they will get all the info. So she does get the info. But that's funny, because my editor was, He's totally fascinated with that same stanza. It's incredible. I'm like, you, you too? Uh, you too, and Ken Wissinger, so that's funny. Um, yeah, music, and you know, my, my husband, Guthrie Ramsey, um, is a musician. And as uh, my friend, also in the audience, graduate school, Michael Harris knows, I was like, yeah, more musicians, but there, I married one anyway. Um, you know, but he even comments like, wow, you know, you, you can, hear music and you know like Archie Shep free jazz and you know like you know love that Robin Thicke song which is so controversial right blurred lines and like still love my pop you know I don't know I guess it's just growing up around all creative people I mean I love visual art the best but I can say that art moves me of whatever kind dance music because I was around it and I grew up with it and I just can't really understand life without these things. And uh, yeah, Earth, Wind and Fire was, I think, the first concert that I went to by myself. Um, and I dressed up for it, you know, and it was very exciting. And they were, you know, coming down out of these spaceships and, and you know, uh, uh, you know, in the garden. But they, uh, we also grew up, you know, as mom will recount, next to the five spot, but also next to Fillmore East. Mm -hmm. um, so these things were also near us, and um, so you know, again, it wasn't like it wasn't part of everyday life. I mean, this is the thing when you're a kid, and then you go to a place like college, and you realize, wow, 
people have not lived this. You know, they don't know that artists are alive. They didn't walk by Fillmore East. I remember meeting one of my college professors. I came out of the door uh, while I was in college. I guess it was a summer or something, and I came out of my door of my house in New York, uh, Lower East Side, and there was one of my college professors. And I was like, wow, what are you doing on this corner? What? And she's like, this is where you grew up? She said, wow, okay, you make sense now. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> you know, but, but you, you know, when you're a child, you have no sense that the world doesn't really, uh, it's not like your world. And then when you find out there's all these other things, you, you know, at first you don't think it's a privilege. I never wanted to be an artist. Because uh, I said they're broke, forget it. I can't spend my last dime on you know paint. I can spend it on maybe a pair of shoes, but not paint. Yeah. Um, but then you realize how privileged that background is, and you realize that um, you really have an obligation to uh, tell people how wonderful this is because it will make their life better. Yeah. Uh, well, my whole romance with music, and I think it is a romance. Started um, one day. There was this object in in, in my house in in Brooklyn, and it was just the lower floor of a family house. And I don't know how they got it in there, but it was a baby grand piano. And I it was got it was purchased for my older sister who was to take lessons. But to me, it was a language and. Um, I, I just was in trance that I could translate my feelings to music. And so music was my first uh, means of expression from the time I was, well, they let me have lessons when I was four. So that, that really began that, and I was supposed to, I passed the test for music in our high school, although the teachers that I played Malaguena, and the, the tester said, where is your Bach? I didn't know where my Bach was. <laughs> <laughs> but I never did go there. So when I got to college, I just figured, OK, I'll just make up my own music. And I did that. And I put on shows. And, and um, my college gave me a bus to go to a little, I went to college in Virginia, a woman's college, and, uh, and which was very important in the 1950s for a girl who was on her own path. And they let me take it to some outlying communities where I'd never been, where people I'd never seen in live theater. And I think that, and I can still summon visual memories of doing that, that just set me on a path to, this is what I want to do. I want to, but, and exactly. I, I want to, like Kelly says, she wants to tell about it. I wanted to give it to people in some way. But I, I never, uh, then, I, uh, then I found words and began to write poetry. So it was gradual. When, when I got to New York, I went to work at a jazz magazine, and it was all over. That was it. And then I got married. <laughs> because I hired the shipping manager. Um, anyway, uh, and, and then we were always around. People, I guess Cecil Taylor would come by, and, and, uh, and Artie Shep lived right downstairs with his family. And so he had a piano. And late at night, I would hear him Posing and oh, sometimes I just sit there and feel like okay, all is right with the world. Um, you know, music if you have it in you from an early age it is something that it will. It, it's both solace and takes you out places in your head. And then of course there was the fire spot, you know. And, uh, and I wasn't so involved with the film more. I was too old by that time. <laughs> Except once when John Coltrane played it. <laughs> so I want to ask one more question before maybe asking the audience to think of things for you to address. And Kelly, we share a common history in that you've done a lot of work with artists of a generation, Martin Perrier, 
Mel Edwards and Jack Whitten and others. We've shown a lot of those artists here. I've worked with several of them over my career. Um, this discussion itself, an idea of intergenerational dialogue and how to rethink certain uh, histories in light of new developments is of interest to me and, and we've done a lot of this at the center. I'm interested in the challenges of being an artist now as opposed to some of the things that were diff a different kind of challenge maybe to artists of uh, an older generation. I mean, David Hammonds in your interview with him and, and I minded gets at this quite specifically in relationship to the artists in now, in now Dig This, which is the sort of expectations of what it meant even to be an artist in a community in Los Angeles versus an artist in New York City, but also what were the expectations of working in a particular period. And I think, at least for me, one of the challenges now is that one is always bumping up against entertainment. And so I'm interested in the idea of how you see the difference of artistic activity then, wherever, however you want to identify then and, and, and now, or now moving forward. Well, I think some of the things that, you know, I think entertainment is a, is a good way to characterize what people bump up against now. And, and probably because it's the use of video and digital, which are some of the same tools that are used by that um, type of industry. Uh, I think, you know, every generation has its own challenges. Um, and I'm sure there are people in the audience that can speak to this probably better who are artists, but I think if there's one thing that people ask me about that I sometimes am mystified by is, um, what about you know, digital, everything being digital? Do you think there'll ever be a time where everything's online and there's no museums or objects? And maybe it's about 500 million years from now, but I, you won't be here, I won't be here, you know? <laughs> it's like, I don't see that because I think people still have the impulse to, to look at things and to have things and to hold things. Now, maybe I'm wrong because that doesn't work with music, right? Everybody's downloading and, and streaming and, you know, and same with television, right? You don't have to sit in front of the TV, you can have it on your phone, you can have it here and there. So yes, that can translate to the art realm, but, um, but I also think artists in their will to take risk uh, don't do that all the time, or they do that in something else, you know. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of um, Rashad Newsom, right? So he does all these videos, and it's, a, you know, this kind of hip-hop voguing thing, but he's also still doing it in real time. I'm thinking of performance artists, you know, Jacoby Satterwhite is another one where, you know, the video is important, but um, there's still the real time or somebody whose work is up now in New York, beautiful show, Wageshi Mutu, who makes these incredible collages and installations, and her kind of major shows always have a, you know, she makes these standalone collages, but she also makes these kind of environments for her shows, which are ephemeral, which don't really exist. I don't know if you can really buy those, but she also makes some incredible videos. So I think artists, include that kind of, I don't know if it's a nod to entertainment, but certainly it's a nod to those tools, but they still are working in ways, their will towards risks mean that they won't only do that, because I think it will compel them to be in the oxygen world, as my husband says. So maybe I'm wrong, but that's, that's the way, that's what they say, yeah, the oxygen, the oxygen world. world. The oxygen. I don't know whether I can, you know, a, a publishing is so much the province of, of commerce. You're dependent so often on people, um, not only uh, to make a book, but now, nowadays to put out an e-book um, and to publicize your work. Self-publishing at the moment is enjoying a great uh, uptick. But um, then how do you publicize your work? Um, how, do you, how does anyone distinguish among a hundred things that come out every day? Uh, 
where do you find excellence? Uh, do you <coughs> turn on a newspaper <coughs> review if you're lucky enough to get one? Or do you, do you depend on an Amazon review, which we there's <laughs> been a, a big expose about how many of those are faked. Um, so you, you really are caught. And I think that, but it's come such a long way from the time that I began, when there was only the printed word in a book to, uh, to offer. And then readings, especially the poetry. I, uh, I have to do a series of lectures in the spring, and one of them is about how um, the new American poetry that was really begun uh, by Ezra Pound and Charles Olson and people way back then has really evolved into hip hop and, and uh, the spoken word. And now there were poetry readings. I remember uh, I, I had a gig in Orlando, Florida, and um, I, I, I uh, got off the plane, and the people who met me said, well, we have to go someplace and, have, and feed you. And so we went to this cafe, but there was a poetry reading going on. And I thought, look at that. They read poetry in Orlando. It's not just Disney. <laughs> but, you know, I've gone to a lot of small places where you'll have a local, a bunch of local poets who read. And that, to me, is, is a wonderful thing. It continues. People enjoy it. It's like going to a concert now. So that's a vast improvement. As far as publishing is concerned, it's all over the place now. So you never can tell what exactly is going to happen. It's very, very much in flux at the moment. Uh, but I noticed that the major publishers are offering almost at the same time as the paperback comes out, now available, says the ad, as a paperback or an ebook. So that's something within this year that has happened. So it's all on the ground. If we've learned anything this morning, it's no sudden move. No sudden move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky I'm in the middle here. <laughs> I know we have, you have your sandwich between the two protectors. Um, I know we have a handheld mic if anyone in the audience wants to ask questions, just for the sake of that. I hang up. Let's just grab it and bring it forward. you have the mic, sir? And just pass it. Over there. Thank you. Um, I have questions about feminism. Um, I read Petty and Duke this summer. I enjoy it, but there are parts that I couldn't relate to exactly. And, uh, Especially in terms of your being a, a young woman, college educated, uh, an adventurer, um, and then falling into a domestic type of situation, it seemed that uh, that framework sort of inhibited you from, this was my interpretation, mm -hmm. uh, of where you were going just coming out of college, being in New York and working for the jazz uh, magazine. And so I, in comparing to that, I said, well, I'm going to read The Feminine Estates by Betty Pan, and I think that helped frame things up for me a little bit more in understanding the culture. Uh, at the same time, I was listening to an NPR interview of one of the top female executives at Google, and the interviewer asked her, are you a feminist? Mm -hmm. And she couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. um, which brings me to, do you think in 2013 we're living in a post-feminist society, and can, uh, is, are these issues still relevant? And uh, I know I'm reading many different things, but please give me your comments on some things. That oh, I'm sure. Knowing. Well, you know, people ask that about the past. Don't forget, we were just a very small group of young women who were uh, in that art scene. The women who were painting were usually um, either married to another painter or um, it, they had started 
prior to their marriage. So they weren't going to stop what they were doing. I really, I, you know, I came from this small college in Virginia. I really had not, and I, I, I was a drama major. I was a lit major. So I really didn't know what I was doing. But um, I learned, I learned on the job. <laughs> and I, I, I took on the job of marriage and motherhood at the same time. But I, I was still making my own decisions. Then what constituted feminism was you earned your own money and were in control of your own money and you had your own apartment. <laughs> that was the, really the big deal. So I felt I had started out like that and I never relinquished my ability. I worked all the time that I was married. In fact, I was very often the sole support of the family. And that gave me a sense of purpose and a, a sense of my own independence. So that even though I was in a domestic situation, it wasn't like Betty Friedan's when she was married. It was different. So that even after my divorce, things remained essentially the same. I was the same person, only not married. Um, as far as feminism, I'm, you know, how can we lose it? Look out! Look, look at the rest of the, look at those women whose faces you can't see. Are we not responsible for them too? Um, and there are people who are caught in domestic situations in this country that we have to defend. Um, and um, when I began to write, the idea of of being a woman was what my subject was because I now understood I had lived a number of years in that role where I had to stick up for myself um, you know fortunately not no matter what everybody thinks about my former husband his politics etc he was not a domestic abuser <laughs> <laughs> that was helpful, um, but um, so I never felt personally abused, but I know women who did, and I felt that the su my subject of myself as a woman, and the, my poem uh, that ends, I've always been at the same time woman enough to be moved to tears and man enough to drive my car in any direction. Now, Lisa told me I should never say that anymore because it was gender identified. But, <laughs> but, but um, now I think it's even more relevant because men can be moved to tears too. Now we're all allowed to be that double identity. And that's what I want to bring forward now, and that we are all, and feminism benefits not just women, but men as well. And I know some real nice house husbands. <laughs> I don't have one. But... <laughs> here, here. <laughs> other, other questions? Um, this question is for Kelly. Uh, it goes back, you made a statement about um, curating, curation, and this idea of narrative. And I wanted to get an idea of your process in that. Is it an artist? Is it an artwork? I know you have this wealth of experience growing up. Could you just expound on that? Um, thanks for coming and thanks for that question. Um, you know, somebody recently told me, I guess there is, uh, well, somebody recently told me that I do a good thematic show. I do a good historical show, and that's hard. If you notice at places like Museum of Modern Art in New York, and you know, I, I don't know the high schedule cold, so I can't call the high schedule on this, but a lot of uh, music, you know, major museums in New York, uh, MoMA, contemporary museums, MoMA, Guggenheim, they, they do these kind of monographic shows, right? Uh, because it's easier, because you don't have to like talk about the hard parts of life, or if you want to talk about history, 
you don't want to you know, narrate those hard things. Um, and I think for me, because um, my exhibition practice is probably more didactic than a lot of people, that I don't mind that. It's always about history in a certain way. Now having said that, I have done my, my share of monographic shows, um, particularly when I was primarily a curator in my first maybe my first 10 years when I was institutionalized, as I call it, when I worked at various places. Um, but since I've been deinstitutionalized, I do a lot of thematic things. Um, and I just find that interesting because I'm really compelled by uh, thematic ideas and by history, more and more by history as an art historian. Um, a show that I am working on now, even though I keep trying to quit being a curator, but it hasn't been successful yet, um, and I'm just going to stop saying that because then maybe it will happen. Um, <laughs> but I'm doing a show with the Brooklyn Museum. I'm uh, co-curating with Teresa Carbone at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, it's a show called Witness, um, Art and uh, Civil Rights in the 60s, uh, which will open in March at the Brooklyn Museum and then will travel to, uh, I think, Dartmouth, uh, and to um, the Blanton Museum at UT Austin. And it's a show that is about celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, which will be in July uh, 2014. And it's over time, since they asked me to do it maybe a couple of years ago, um, it's become more and more important given the kind of politics that we've seen in this country over the years. And, um, you know, what's happened to the Voting Rights Act and those things. So it's, it's a show that became even more important after I signed on to it. So I'm happy to do that. It's a show that is a show of a variety of artists, um, not just African American artists, uh, if you will. Um, and um, so I'm happy to do something like that, which is about something that is important to our history. We know, for instance, and I know we've seen here in Atlanta, that the photographs of that time period are well known. Charles Moore, uh, Gordon Parks, others. Um, but also to add in the visual art, the paintings, and paintings by people you may not have thought of. Robert Rauschenberg, mm. Jim Dine, Robert Indiana, um, people like Mae Stevens, going back to feminism, we would know him. But to see how much those other artists Frank Stella, that we, Frank Stella has a painting called Bouquet for Malcolm, or, or I think it's called Malcolm's Bouquet, um, you know, commemorating uh, the death of Malcolm X, the assassination of Malcolm X. Who knew Frank Stella had this painting, right? So to put these kind of artists in dialogue with people like Benny Andrews, uh, people like Barbara Jones who, you know, unite the famous fist, Sarah Graf, um, is, is is really powerful. And then the other thing that has been happening uh, with these kind of shows for me lately is that museums are ending up buying things. So um, Brooklyn was able to purchase uh, a wonderful collection of paintings uh, or mixed works of all kinds um, that document the Black Arts Movement, the, the Lusenhof collection. And uh, so that will be a major part of it. Um, when I did Now Dig This, uh, MoMA bought um, works by 12 of the artists in the Now Dig This um, show. So I think somehow when you have these kind of broad ideas, it allows people to come in at different points. And, and right now, I, there is this, who knew, this kind of renaissance, or renaissance implies that it's happened before, so maybe we can't say that. But um, there's a will for many institutions, also overseas, for instance, the Tate, Museum in uh, Britain to purchase works by African American artists. So that's been very, very exciting to see how some of these ideas have generated so much activity in different areas. Um, so I know I've probably gone off topic, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah. As an historian, an art historian in particular, um, you certainly are a storyteller, and even as a curator, as a curator, 
But I'm really curious about that, um, the, the bouquet for uh, uh, Malcolm. How did you come across that thing? Research. Give yeah, how? I mean, tell, tell me the story. Well, um, did I find that one? You know, I, that's one of the reasons I became a professor, kind of unwillingly, you know, when I was finishing my, I got into graduate school because I thought, okay, I'm gonna finish this degree, I'm gonna get, rise to the top of the museum world back, I won't, I won't have to rise through the ranks for 20, 30 years, I'm just gonna be at the top grade. Uh, but when I, when I finished, came to the end, and I had a choice between like the best job in the country and and another great job in the academy, I chose the academy because I realized I was really an idea person and uh, I loved that. I, I, I didn't say I was a great teacher, but I knew I was dedicated to ideas and I loved the schedule better in the academy, so I went with that, shocking my own self. <laughs> uh, but one of the, the also compelling reasons, even though I never thought I was the best teacher, I well, was a great teacher, um, is that you, you get to influence a lot of young people or work with them. And they, as she said, you learn as much from them as they learn from you. So I've always had the great opportunity to work with great students. And prob I, I do believe one of those great students probably found that painting uh, given um, the fact that we had hired some, some graduate students and, um, and that we had them working for us. And it, I, so I don't know if I particularly found that piece, but maybe somebody else. I mean, uh, there's always pieces that, you know, there are a lot of pieces that I've been teaching over time that automatically went on the list. Mm -hmm. But then there were some new finds and things that we hadn't known about. So um, it's always a collaborative process for me, you know. I mean, I have my idea about things, but it's certainly if you're working with a co-curator, uh, and Terry may have found that piece, uh, Teresa Carbon, um, you know, it's, you want to be in a collaborative situation with somebody, and um, you learn from them as well. If I just may add that um, Kelly, what does, Kelly is not self-promoting, but I am a mother, and I'm a mother, <laughs> mothers are self-promoting. But she's just always been um, ahead of the game mm -hmm. in what she has found, and what she noticed, and what she brought to everyone to show this is important, look at it. And even I, uh, even the poem that's in now in in uh, I and I minded that I wrote about her a long time ago. She would travel the subway to go to music and art high school and that, um, and the things that she noticed uh, uh, in the poem that there's a Muslim woman eating a Mars bar under her veil, <laughs> and 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 little black boys in the mulberry trees at City College, where the High School of Music and Art used to be located, with purple tongues from the, the berries. But who would have thought of bringing home these pictures? But she always brought things like that, and has always noticed what other people have not yet seen. Mm. I guess that's at home gone. <laughs> <laughs> This question is for Kelly. Um, I wanted to ask you, as someone who's a specialist in African American art, but also a curator in many different kinds of art, um, in the field of curating and also in academia, um, is it something that, uh, as the world kind of has become more contemporary, people want to be kind of more identity-less or not labeled so much? Um, do you fall into a category as being, oh, that's the African-American uh, art specialist? Like, how do you function in these? Um, I'm asking from a kind of personal perspective as well, as someone who's um, gotten a lot of experience in a particular region, but very interested in kind of um, existing in multiple contexts and multiple stories. Um, you know, people can put that label on you, but I think you know, if you flip it to another side, for instance, I have a wonderful colleague at NYU named Edward Sullivan, I don't know if you know his work. He's been known for his work in Latin America, um, but he starts out um, many years ago, uh, you know, his dissertation is on Spain. And, you know, he then 
goes on to study Latin America and not just your kind of canonical places like Brazil or Mexico, but Dominican Republic, one of the few books on contemporary art of the Dominican Republic or the history of art in the Dominican Republic. Um, and he's worked from colonial to contemporary. So I think, you know, when you look at other examples, it's easy, you know, it's not a problem for people to do that. But somehow, if you say, you know, one of the things you think about as African American artists, people are going to say, oh, but is that too narrow? Well, no, it's just another history. Um, and, you know, I also do Latin American, I also getting into Caribbean, I also do women. I mean, you know, there's, there's many things that I do, um, but I'm not ashamed of the work that I've done on African American artists because I think um, it's really exciting. And what I've, what I've found now, and then I always, you know, it's exciting to find histories that people don't know about. I find that really exciting, you know, that kind of sleuthy detective thing, you know. Um, and I think also my students, what I, what I love about teaching at Columbia, some great students, and um, they, even though, uh, particularly the graduate students, but also other students, um, they will take my courses and it's just another area for them to learn. And it's okay to learn about performance art through a lens of African American artists. Um, and they don't feel that that's bad or that's keeping them from something else. They feel that those things that we've learned in there, they can apply to the work whether or not they're focusing on African American artists or not. And, and so I think in today's world, um, that's okay. And, and those students, it's been very gratifying to work with many of these students because they feel that it's not keeping them, by studying African American artists, it's keeping from them from the real histories. Mm -hmm. uh, they see it as a kind of, just part of history that they're, they can look at and they can apply these lessons elsewhere. So I think the world now, you know, I, I continue to be an optimist about what the things I do can teach people. Um, people, other people will do things a different way. That's fine, this is the way I do it. You don't like it? Do your own show. You know, like, you know, I was like, somebody wants to say, why didn't you put this person in your show? It's like, you know, everybody can't be in every show. And if you think that person needs a show, go do it. You know, it's great, fantastic. So I want to just, I think we, we could go on and on, but I think I want to sort of end by, by saying that we have uh, ordered some books by both of these. Um, Ladies, they are available up front, but, but many of you know that, that we published a book uh, now two years ago called The Art Life, which I wrote and sort of compiled. Um, but I, I feel like one of the things that I want to end by, by just thanking you for being here, but also you, you both really exemplify the nature of what I meant by that title, which is that this is not a um, short-term commitment. The idea of being invested in making things, invested in the world of ideas, the investment in the community, and speaking for and against things is a lifetime sort of choice. And so um, we're really happy that you could be here and, and we value the things that you do in that regard. And, and just thank you all for coming. Thank you.